Today we have a, an, a, a, a unique, perhaps, sort of double presentation with um, ample time to ask questions and um, give comments. There are um, two papers today, both uh, dealing with the literature of partition, population exchange, and um, division. Uh, the first paper um, is by Aslu Uziz, um, who is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of World Literature at Simon Fraser. University, and I hear will soon be joining um, the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Arizona as a faculty member. Congratulations. That's quite a coup in this job market. Um, she will be speaking, um, her work deals with international human rights, with minority li literature, and on the politics of recognition um, through the analysis of collective memory here relating to the um, Greek Turkish population exchange of the early 20th century. The title of her paper today is Reading Through Personal Maps and Recipes of Origin, Recollecting Fragments from the 1923 Greco-Turkish Compulsory Religious Minority Exchange. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome um, Pyong Hee Choi, who is an associate professor in the Department of East Asia, Asian Languages and Civilizations right here at the University of Chicago. I'm ashamed to say we haven't met, even though we're colleagues, uh, just a few buildings away. Um, she has a, a distinguished record of publication and scholarship in gender studies and Korean literature specifically. Um, and her forthcoming book, which I will buy as soon as it comes out with uh, Cornell, is entitled Beneath the Vermilion Ink, Japanese Colonial Censorship and the Making of Modern Korean Literature, which promises to be very interesting. Um, her title today is South Korean Women Writers Representations of Natural, National Division. We're hoping to get our speaker, not only to learn a great deal from our speakers, get them speaking to one another, and also to us. So let me just begin right away. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for coming. I know it's not a very <laughs> springy day, but um, there we go. I'm pushing this a second. OK. In the early 2000s, the son of a deceased woman, originally from Greece, but deported by the Greek government and sent to Turkey for resettlement because she was Muslim and therefore subjected to the 1923 Greco-Turkish Compulsory Religious Minority Exchange, went to Hania, a town located on the Greek island Crete, to find his mother's house. Let's call him K. Kay was in his 60s and time had come to revisit his mother's past, or the way he put it during our interview, his roots. He had all the right directions his authoritarian aunt and the sister of his mother had minutely described, and one early morning he went to the shore, turned his back to the still standing mosque, and started walking following the directions. Before long, he found his mother's house. Deeply moved, he knocked on the door and an older Greek woman opened it. Before he could say anything, Kay burst into tears in front of the astounded woman. She was surprised. Um, and uh, he explained, therefore he explained, uh, this used to be his mother's house and why she had to leave. The elder Greek woman, who herself was originally from Turkey and sent to Turkey as part of the population exchange, uh, excuse me, and deeply moved in turn, so she was she had experienced the exchange from the other side, uh, and she was deeply moved in turn, welcomed him in. Things followed one another, and before they knew it, they were both drunk with Uzo, and it was not until late in the afternoon that he left his mother's house. Grateful to the Greek woman who opened him her house, her heart, and a big bottle of Uzo, Kay felt was he, he was finally in touch with his roots. With great joy, he rushed to call his aunt in Turkey to tell her the story. However, as soon as she, uh, the word Hania came out of his mouth, his aunt interrupted him, yelling and asking him what on earth he thinks he's doing in Hania. She had told him very clearly, she said, Kandye, not Hania, that's where they were from. So um, <laughs> not only, um, which is to the other side of the island, not only um, he was in the wrong town, but also in the wrong house, and most certainly cried with the wrong woman. But nonetheless, was his experience in that house less real? When I asked about why he chose um, to go to Crete now, 
Kay answered Crete had always been present in the family, but lately he felt the island was calling him. As much as Crete might have been always present in his family, as Kay states, because he didn't uh, speak Greek with a Cretan dialect, the fact that he didn't know the difference between Kandie and Hanya, that is his mother's hometown, suggests that the details of his family history are a rather recent interest for this person. But what is the significance of this uh, anecdote for the purposes of this talk? National identification practices and nationalist historiography in Turkey have long focused on erasing differences and diversity and configuring a homogeneously defined nation. The last step taken in that direction at the international arena is the 1923 Greek-Turkish compulsory religious minority exchange aimed at homogenizing the nation by first creating a majority of Muslims in Turkey. As you might know, uh, the idea was to first create a majority of Muslims, then to secularize them. That was the um, Turkish Republic's project. Um, and yet, while this, step, uh, while this was a step towards homogenizing the country, the incomers and the locals were not necessarily compatible. Neither such differences in identity nor ruptures like the population exchange found a public space for articulation up until recently. Over the last two decades, however, we see a change in this equation in some circles. As numerous documentary novels and films, memoirs and family histories have circulated publicly, they invited their audiences to engage their stories not only as eyewitness accounts uh, to past obscured ruptures such as the population exchange, but also to discover the plurality of backgrounds beyond national identity. In fact, an increasing personalization of geography through familial attributes and memories became an anchor for self-identification in contemporary Turkey, traceable through family history and personal narratives in the public domain. Perhaps one of the most publicly revisited past ruptures in that context has been the 1923 Greek-Turkish compulsory population exchange. And, uh, and um, in fact, this is a part of a manuscript. And in, this, in the manuscript, um, I do argue that, in fact, making the stories of uh, individual stories of the Greco-Turkish ruptures uh, uh, opened space for contesting other ruptures publicly. Um, I won't have time to get into the why uh, right now, but if you're interested, I would be happy to address it in the question and answer section. Um, so while some scholars legitimately explain this recent interest in the past in Turkey with disillusionment with the present or a nostalgia, it is also true that what anthropologist Rebecca Bryant describes uh, in, relation to her, uh, in, in relation to Cyprus as the postmodern demand for the particular and answering the question, who are we, seems to have caught up with Turkey as well. Kay's story uh, exemplifies the dynamics in contemporary Turkey um, with his lack of knowledge of his mother's hometown and a rather recent decision to visit her island in the 2000s, which suggests he developed a rather recent interest in his own history, family history. Um, and when I asked him, uh, just a quick note here, when I asked him whether he knew about his family history details, Kay also told me, um, I quote, no, I don't know we were ignorant back then. I guess we were just, uh, were, we just weren't curious about these things, unquote. My approach to these dynamics is a little different. This new interest in the past, I suggest, is symptomatic of a reconfiguration of the relationship between the individual and history especially if we consider how nationalist history has been the foundation of the Turkish national identity, which configures a different kind of relationship between individuals as citizens uh, of Turkey um, and their history, um, erasing differences, um, at least in the Turkish context, um, in official history. And then we can see the significance of this shift in engaging the past at a personal level as probing the contours of national identity. In this context, these changes and the reconfiguration of the relationship between the individual and history, in my opinion, can be considered metaphorically as a question of literacy. Uh, that is, gaining a new kind of literacy understood as a traceable or legible self-identification through family histories, 
pursued to geographies of origin, as opposed to what anthropologist Esra Özgürek calls administered forgetting of such identifications by nationalist ideologies and practices, such as the change and Latinization of the alphabet in 1928, or distancing of official history from the Ottoman legacy, as exemplified in history school textbooks or the first Turkish History Congress in 1932, which, did, which was the first history congress that was generating a discussion about where to anchor the history of Turks. Um, so um, for this purpose, in my presentation today, I will first offer a panorama of the growing interest in the past in Turkey, which I will approach as indicative of a reconfiguration of the relationship between the individual and history. And next, I will locate family history writing into that general larger picture to finally briefly attend to two family histories. I doubt I will have much time for the second one, but I'll, have, uh, I'll be talking about the first one mostly. Um, uh, so the first one is a family cookbook that traces the family recipes all the way to the maps of present day Greece to Jewish converts or Dönme followers of Messianic rabbi Shabbatai Tsevi from Salonika. Uh, the other is a private family history book that traces its background to a Venetian Christian convert into Islam in Crete. Both families were converted in the 17th century and uh, deported by Greece as part of the 1923 Greco-Turkish religious minority exchange because they were now Muslims. My goal here, however, is not to analyze these family histories or narratives in depth, or nor to put into question the accuracies of their stories or what happened in the past. Rather, my goal is to explore the significance of recollecting such family histories today within the context of Greek-Turkish population exchange and what this has to tell us about con the contemporary dynamics in Turkey, especially in relation to the discussions on Turkish national identity. So uh, first, a brief historical background on the 1923 Greek-Turkish population exchange, which has the longest name, I think. Uh, as an event, um, and its significance for discussing the Turkish national identity. Following the 1919-1922 Greco-Turkish War in Asia Minor, um, Turkey's heartland, Anatolia, today, the Lausanne Convention was signed in January 1923. I quote, as from the 1st of May 1923, they sh there shall take place a compulsory exchange of Turkish nationals of the Greek Orthodox religion established in Turkish territory and of Greek nationals of Muslim religion established in Greek territory. These persons shall not return to live in Turkey or Greece respectively without the authorization of the Turkish government or of the Greek government respectively." Unquote. However, while this seemingly looked like an exchange based on clearly defined categories, religion, it was not a smooth process as the two state officials envisioned. First of all, religion as a category did not necessarily translate individual allegiances and self-identification. Second, while the exchange was geared towards homogenizing the country, it did not render the experiences of the people, not all those subject to the exchange wanted to leave, and not all exempt from it wanted to stay. And not all spoke the language of the recipient country, where many were discriminated against in both contexts. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, in, in when the new arriving communities in Turkey, um, they were often referred to as the Greek seed and um, Yunan Dölü. And the ones in Greece, I have uh, recollected those um, uh, in my interviews, they were called uh, Turkosporos. Um, uh, not all of them, of course, but it, which meant uh, the Turkish seed. So in both contexts, uh, an insult, meant to be an insult. And there are gender dynamics going on in that, um, in the implications of the, of the so-called um, the seed. Um, so um, for example, uh, the Gagos, coming back to the, those who uh, wanted to uh, leave but were exempt from the exchange, the Gagos, who were Orthodox Christians but identified themselves with Turkish nationalism, uh, wanted to be included into the population exchange but were rejected by the Turkish state because they were Christians. 
Others wanted to stay, even though they were forced to leave, such as the case of the Dönme uh, in Salonika, that is the followers of the Messianic rabbi Shabbatai Tsevi, who in 1666 converted to Islam. During the population exchange uh, negotiations, the Dönme wanted to remain in Greece, resorting to their Jewish roots. But the government in Athens refused on the grounds that they were now Muslims. Historian Mark Bayer states how other Dönme approached Turkish officials and when one of them asked Ruzanur, the second most important representative of the Turkish delegation to the Lausanne conference, to exclude the community from the population exchange, he realized that, and I quote, this means they are a group in Turkey that thinks differently and has opposite interests than Turks. The disaster for us is that they appear as Turks. Greeks and Armenians are better than they, if for no other reason than we know, they are Greeks and Armenians. This foreign element, this parasite, hides in our blood." Unquote. And upon the arrival of the Dönme to Turkey, the community has always been subjected to controversy, and not only it is still rare to find a member of the community to be public about it, uh, like Esin Adan, the author of the book I will address later, but also conspiracy theories are woven around them. Another difficulty um, with categorization, and actually most recently it, these conspiracy th theories um, have gained a more anti-Semitic undertone uh, in Turkey. Um, another difficulty with categorization uh, was, for example, the case of um, Cretans. Historian Molly Green argues that after Venice surrendered uh, to the island of Crete to the Ottomans, uh, a large group of Venetians converted to Islam and remained mostly Greek speakers. This happens in the 17th century. Because there were no large-scale resettlements of Muslims from the mainland, uh, she estimates that the majority of Cretan Muslims were in fact those who converted to Islam from Christianity, mostly in order to have a more, um, probably a more beneficiary status. Uh, following uh, the 1923 Greco-Turkish population exchange, when the Cretan Muslims were repatriated in Turkey, not all of them spoke Turkish, but Greek. In fact, some also managed to go back or to stay after the exchange precisely because they had claimed and obtained Italian citizenship, which freed them from the binds of the exchange. Cretan Muslims were also among the most discriminated against because they either didn't speak Turkish at all or when they did with a heavy Greek accent. So unlike the Dönme where the question was the truthfulness and allegiance of the community through religion, whether they were really Muslims, um, in the case of Cretans it was the Greekness attributed to them, probably because of their language skills. For example, various citizens speak Turkish campaigns were launched in Balıkesir, um, targeting against these communities, where most of which had settled, especially in Ayvalık and Junda across from the Greek island Lesbos. Um, and uh, a quick note here is that about 15% of the exchanged people coming from Greece were settled here. And um, more recently in Junda, um, in uh, that area, uh, in the public spaces at 5 p.m. on Fridays, you would hear the national anthem. So it's almost like performing your citizenship. Um, and in Junda, you have an overwhelmingly Cretan and um, co communities co arriving from Crete and from Lesbos. Um, so, uh, considering how in former Ottoman provinces, it is very difficult to trace one's origin to any particular reference point given the fact that there were dynamic population movements and resettlement policies, relocations and exiles, and of course, conversion. As I tried to address with a few examples here, it wouldn't be wrong to say that the, where one's origins lie becomes an, an individual choice um, rather than um, whether it is a private choice or a public one. And thank you. And these two may not always um, overlap. So one anchors one's self-identification by choosing a reference point. Um, then what can the trend of the growing interest in the personal histories and resorting to family backgrounds then, um, and choosing new reference points as a means for self-identification in public can tell us about the dynamics of today. Until recently, the widest circulating uh, historical account was the National Historiography's version perhaps most visible in history education in Turkey. 
Sociologist Chalar Kader calls attention uh, to the impact of the population exchange on nationalist historiography because, I quote, it had serious implications for the nationalist ideology that became the official historiography of the Turkish nation state. As the last step in the international arena toward homogenizing the Turkish nation, the exchange was excised from national history. This national history became, and until recently continued to be, the unchallengeable foundation of Turkish identity. Um, the Republican founders of the state opted for a blatantly constructed artifact with no reference to lived history, which later emerged as the true story of the land and its population." Unquote. Um, similarly, historian Esra Donajoğlu considers national historiography in Turkey as, I quote, uh, state-sponsored or institutionally centralized as a field void of human experiences in sansızlaştırılmış, void of human beings uh, is the word she's using, and even in most cases uh, seen as a whole of national thesis, unquote. So while the relationship between the individuals and history were configured nationally in the early years of the Republic, their personal experiences were excluded to be sacrificed for a meta-narrative of the Turkish nation, tracing its origins elsewhere. This was accomplished with the 1932 uh, history uh, and 1937, excuse me, history congresses. Um, at the same time, Danajoğlu points out how in Turkish history, motherland is sacred. Uh, history writing. Motherland is uh, sacred and how um, local interpretations of identities are perceived as bringing heterogeneous counter dynamics to the homogeneously defined territory. In other words, as a possible threat to homogeneity. With such diversity, including individual experiences to national history, would de facto bring local identities into question, as Cretan uh, and heterogeneity. Thus, Charles Arcader argues the absence of um, the lived experience of the existing population or of the abundant physical evidence of, uh, of a prior non homogeneous population in the official version of national history and identity manifests a conscious effort to uh, create a coherent narrative of the national past and a homogeneous Turkish nation. It is precisely this depersonified national history, void of personal experiences, and which eclipses identity differences that rendered the past legible in many ways, illegible, excuse me, um, illegible in many ways, including distancing from Ottoman legacy and identification and the change of the alphabet that is going through a reconfiguration process in contemporary Turkey. And if this history has been the foundation of Turkish national identity, as Kedar argues, then we could say that it is the contours of Turkish citizens' identities that are being reconsidered through individualizing, personalizing history. Thus, with an emphasis on the individual, eyewitness accounts um, emerge as a narrative strategy to restore, um, so to speak, um, hitherto despicable, silenced and manipulated past facts through voicing individual narratives and personal histories written by the state-sponsored historiography. Of course, eyewitness accounts, um, they're not new, nothing new, but because of the present context, they gain a new value, they have a new um, symbolic power. Um, but at the same time, like anything else, memory is mediated. And it, of course, it should be considered as such, but I'm uh, explaining this, uh, addressing the eyewitness accounts as a possible step for opening the past into negotiation and different identities, rather than saying we should be taking that as, as a, as a uh, sign of, oh, this is what actually really happened. Um, within this framework, one of the fo uh, first and most frequently revisited past events in contemporary Turkish public domain has been the Greek-Turkish population exchange, be perhaps because it offers an opportunity to probe how realistic it is to homogenize a nation and enforce Turkishness. Um, in this context, the position of eyewitnesses extend to that of um, informants, which has its own problems, of course, who are regarded as those who will unveil a past unspoken or unknown event, be both in the public domain and within families. 
Thus, eyewitness stature, uh, stature brings a new kind of agency that is the authority to tell stories in public while oral accounts and testimonies are predominantly um, regarded as authentic documents by the public, in my interviews it came across as such, um, shedding light to the past obscured events. Now, I would like to show a panorama uh, of the recent interest in the past in Turkey to offer a general picture for this um, change and, oops, help. While we are doing this, I, I wanted to address this um, question. One of the things that is of most interest to me in this lecture series, and I hope we will have maybe more discussion about this, um, I would like to look at the relationship between individual and history in the context of part, different partitions and whether that could be a ground for comparison to look into the dynamics um, of, of how this has been, um, has been configured in different contexts themselves and different geographies in Chicago. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So um, here is a photo from the Prince's Islands in Istanbul, Büyükada, summer 2003. Um, this is when I was um, conducting my field work. Um, the announcement of two books, one of which is called My Memories, uh, and the other, uh, Human Landscapes from Büyükada, the shop that sells time, bringing back the memories of the past and the multicultural scene of the island with Greek Orthodox, Jewish, Muslim, and Armenian populations. Both signs were posted on the quay, where the ferries come from and leave for mainland Istanbul, exposed to the view of the public. If we remember how historian Esra Donajolu had said that local identities were seen as a threat to homogeneity, um, these photos and advertised books point at a change as in the signs there is a clear emphasis on multiculturalism of the island with its Armenians, Greeks, Jews and Muslims, and local identity is underlined. Um, another word I want to call in attention uh, uh, here is um, the word witness used in the blurb advertising my memories, the one on the left, um, as it invites the readers to read this book as a memoir of a true islander uh, who witnessed the best times of the island. So um, a way of transmitting local, uh, local culture and local identity. Here is another photo I took in uh, summer 2003 at Pandora Bookshop, one of the most important bookshops in Istanbul. The shelves display various memoirs with a very um, interesting one uh, that has the title, The Things I Heard from an Old Revolutionary, the title of which attests to its testimonial character, documenting what the author heard from the anonymous revolutionary. Another title reads, A Revolutionary Doctor's Memories, Looking at the titles, an interesting phenomenon to notice that the name of the author or who the author is as an individual seems to have lost its importance in these memoirs. Their function as reporting some phenomenon uh, from the past being underlined. Um, looking at the titles, one decides to read the book according to the interest in the um, witnessed event, uh, for the lack of a better word, um, at the uh, witnessed event by the author rather than who the author is. Thus, the author slash um, witness is set as informant. There are two key points that are of particular significance here. First, while the books, uh, these books advertised in public spaces and displayed on the shelves of bookstores are configured as eyewitness accounts, they also offer a new historical literacy um, of, uh, opportunity to their readers. Multiple accounts offer multiple readings of the past. And this doesn't mean eyewitness accounts cannot be uh, um, or should, not, should be taken as direct uh, documentations for the past or, and cannot be problematic. Um, not at all. Uh, as I said, memory is mediated like anything else. Um, but still, they open spaces for discussion, to, for multiple ways of reading the past. The second point I want to highlight here is the tendency in personifying and personalizing uh, personalization of history. Considering sociologist Kedar and historian Donajolu's claims about Turkish nationalist historiography as a depersonified field, uh, where there were no um, 
references to lived history, these few examples that I chose among many illustrate a change in terms of a new relationship with history in the public domain. History is being repopulated, if you will, um, by bringing in personal faces attached to the narratives of the past. That is to say, unlike before, it is not necessarily public figures or intellectuals, but anyone whose stories de deemed to be important can publish his or her memoirs or personal accounts, which wasn't the case before. Um, uh, there would have been something, uh, you would have to be at least somebody, but right now it's just, it, as long as you, it is going to shed some, uh, you know, some lights or offer a multiple reading or an alternative reading to any past event, you can publish your memoirs and um, books much easier in the, in the publishing market in Turkey. As for the growing interest for the, in the past in the 1990s, one of the institutional motors behind this is the History Foundation, an NGO founded in 1991. On its website, the foundation declares that it aims to involve ordinary people in history writing, and I quote, endeavors to help the Turkish people form a direct, truly comprehensive and non-instrumentalist relationship with their own history and to make the subject of their own history a field for civic action." Unquote. So here is a picture uh, from a poster promoting the oral history collection project initiated by the History Foundation um, in 2002. Every Sunday, one oral history account was published in a na popular national newspaper, Milliet, and uh, this also included uh, stories of the Greek-Turkish population exchange. This project, titled 1,000 Live Witnesses to History, calls people to, in Turkey to join in the initiative of telling their life stories with the slogan, we don't lose uh, the stories embodied in a person because we record them. Uh, literally, it's we don't lose because we record, but we can paraphrase or um, uh, elaborate on it in, in, with its true implication in, uh, uh, about the stories being embodied by the uh, people and the importance of recording them. Again, all those portraits brought together without bodies, but only faces, and most importantly, the eyes catching the attention as they seemingly look at the spectator, re-emphasize their eyewitness value. These individuals are not presented to their audience as a whole for who they are, but for what they can tell about what they saw, while the black and white presentation of the photo invites the spectator to think about the past, the old times, to which these witnesses can attest and reveal the past facts so carefully silenced by official historiography. When I mention how individual narratives of the past became a new source for, of information through their um, eyewitness value in Turkey, I don't mean to say that individual narratives didn't exist, um, they were just not publicly as accessible as they are today, and now because of the, as I said, of the political moments, they gain a new meaning. Um, parallel to this, uh, a boom in Ottoman script and language courses has been observable, especially since late 1990s, pointing at another aspect of the new literacy of the past, only this time it is literally a question of literacy. For instance, national newspapers advertise different courses on this topic, including the one organized by the History Foundation, the NGO that I was mentioning earlier, publicized with the slogan, Dedemin mektuplarını okumak istiyorum. Uh, I want to read my grandfather's letters. Um, this advertisement calling for learning how to read Ottoman in order to be able to read the documents from the past is another instance of personalized history. After the Republican reform movements towards Latinization of the alphabet and Turkification of the language, it is not a secret that most individuals in contemporary Turkey are not equipped to read and un or understand documents written before, written before the modification of the alphabet in 1928. And yet, the way the public is reached out to join a campaign to learn how to read and understand Ottoman, that is to gain literacy into the Ottoman past, is with a personal slogan reminding individuals in Turkey that they do not have access to their family documents, such as letters, notebooks, or diaries, and inviting them, in a sense, to re-own their history through claiming their family history. This is especially important as it speaks to both to a new value attributed to personal fa family documents, but also to a change in the relationship 
between, uh, with the past, personifying, personalizing history. Um, likewise, uh, in a popular um, Turkish daily, Radikal, in 2003, uh, the newspaper announced the History Foundation High School History Writing Competition um, with the following title, History Begins with the Family. And called attention to how hard it is to uh, trace family background with the motto, anything beyond grandfathers is a myth. Again, a similar family history writing competition organized by the Istanbul Bilgi University and um, the Foundation, History Foundation. I don't mean to be repetitive, but I just wanted to call your attention to this little blurb here. Um, and um, uh, at that, in that corner, a professor of history is giving almost like a, 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 some directions as to how one can uh, write family history. And so if you were not a high school student who wanted to still collect your family history, you have the instructions, a little, you know, a little blurb there. So it reaches beyond the um, audience of the high school students. I mentioned History Foundation here because it's a major institution, but it was not the only one. Uh, as the emergence of three major history periodicals addressing at general public readers rather than professional readers manifested a growing interest in the past at the level of creating popular history culture for the reading public in Turkey. An escalating number of books, movies, and music albums have communicated and reintroduced the Anatolian past uh, uh, with and into the Turkish present, bringing the stories of past and present peoples of Turkey to the public domain, simultaneously opening the curtains of the past and raising retrospective questions about the present in an attempt to retrieve the oppressed stories and take lessons, possibly, for the future. In this light, I consider making um, personal histories public through family histories as cast against the backdrop of these changes transformations in the public domain in Turkey. So um, there are different ways in which individuals would negotiate and act upon uh, reconfig the reconfiguration between individuals and uh, history um, in Turkey's public domain, and here is one of them. One of my interlocutors, Ali Onay, uh, who considers himself Cretan, um, uh, and um, recently established uh, a, a Cretan Muslim, I should specify, now located in Turkey, recently established a home museum. When I asked him what inspired him uh, to establish this home museum now, he, uh, he said that more people seem to be interested in family history today and that people like myself started coming to his house, so he set up this home museum to make, it, uh, to make the process easier for people like me. Uh, <laughs> Um, so here is the, um, you see the picture of the boat, Gül Cemal, that brought the Cretans to Turkey. Um, garments, some more objects and Ottoman, uh, Ottoman documents on the walls, and underneath you have minute descriptions of what they are. Um, and some more objects in his own museum. <coughs> and uh, he has also been interviewed by the um, 1,000 Witnesses to History, Oral History Project, um, by, organized by History Foundation. And his story has been published in the popular Turkish daily as well, um, Milliet, as I had mentioned before. So he was one of those um, whose story had been made public about the exchange. So um, this, I really won't have time to get into the second one, unfortunately, but I'll talk about the um, first family history that I want to address in my um, talk today. Actress, translator, and author Esin Eden comes from a family in Salonika, Greece. Her books in English and in Turkish are different. The Turkish version, um, they are both cookbooks, the Turkish version is a cookbook memoir, whereas the English version is presented as a uh, family history with several prefaces and historical notes about Shabbatai Tsevi and how to approach the recipes written by um, Nikos Stavroulakis, a uh, Jewish Greek American who lives in Hanya, Crete, and who actually recently opened, uh, reopened the synagogue there for services. Um, so, uh, unlike the, and he's also, Nikos Stavroulakis is also the person, you see his name there, he's also the person who introduced me to Kay, whose story I opened, uh, who was in the mistaken house um, and town, um, uh, whose story I opened this talk with. Um, 
So uh, it is Nikos Stavroulakis also has a degree in New Eastern Studies from the University of Michigan. Um, so um, graduate degree. So unlike, uh, so he was the one who actually asked Esinedan uh, to, uh, to uh, or who encouraged her to uh, bring her family uh, recipes together and to publish this book. Um, however, um, unlike the English version of Esinedan's book, the Turkish edition does not mention anything about Shabbatianism. When I asked her why during our meeting on July 1st, 2003 in Bukada, uh, the island I mentioned before with the signs on the quay, it's the same place, that's where she was, um, her summer house, and uh, she answered me that the Turkish publishing company did not want to get into Shabbatianism. For this reason, she left it out of the Turkish version. This statement suggests that even though different aspects of the population exchange are brought to the public domain, there are still taboos in public articulations of identificatory differences, and the fact that some stories about a rupture start becoming public does not, uh, we, cannot, uh, and we cannot actually uh, assume necessarily that silences are broken around that event, precisely because just like anything else, silences are also not homogeneous. So you can reveal one aspect of it, but the other aspects of it might still remain un less known or unknown or, um, or not encouraged to be articulated. The English edition comes with Nikos Stavroulakis' historical introduction about how to approach the recipes, calling attention to the difficulty of identifying the followers of Shabbatai Tsevi, because they neither wanted to clearly identify themselves as Jewish nor as Muslims. So then, is identification based on religion? If so, which one? Is it geographic origin as Selanikli, being from Salonika, the, ge the local identity? Is it linguistic as Greek or Salonika dialect Ottoman? Or is it citizenship to a nation state as Turkish? But then, how inclusive is this citizenship given the differences even in the Turkish and English versions of the same book. For example, this show, photo that shows um, a relative of Esineden in the Greek attire in the English version is omitted uh, from the Turkish version. It's not there. Um, and so all these questions attest to the complexity of identification and raise questions about what actually we might mean when we say ethnicity, which is a uh, a complex term, but also sometimes I find too easily articulated. Um, the English preface explains how the recipes were taken from the notebooks of Esineden's two great aunts, Sabire and Melek, written in Ottoman. With this page here, uh, where you can see a copy from Sabire's recipe notebook de decorating the page, I want to return to the question of historical literacy, that is the legibility of the past. In fact, when I met Esineden, she told me that because the notebooks were written in Ottoman with a Salonika dialect, she had no access to them. As part of the Turkish nation building project, as I was mentioning before, the Latinization of the alphabet and the Turkification of the language divorced Turkish people from, uh, from, their, um, from their Turkish nationals, from their past, um, or made it more difficult to access it. And if we remember how the claims to re-own history at an individual level through family history became a common discourse in contemporary Turkey's public domain, with Ottoman language courses advertised as, I can read the letters of my grandfather that I addressed earlier, Esineden's case is a perfect example of this. She could not read Ottoman script, and Ottoman paleography is notorious for its difficulty. However, that was not the only problem. Esinedan told me that she searched for three years to find someone who could decipher her great aunt's notebooks, recipe notebooks. Those who had paleography reading skills could not decode the notebooks either um, because it was written with a Salonika dialect unknown to many that she consulted. So even if they could read Ottoman uh, script or Ottoman paleography, uh, they had the Ottoman paleography, uh, skills, they could still not decipher the Salonika dialect. So she really went out of her way to render her um, past legible, if you will. Um, so in this sense, rendering the past legible through personal and family history functions both literally and metaphorically. Uh, also, cookbooks are um, 
I find them interesting because they embody the intersection of complex dynamics that engage family history, geographic origin, and in which recipes and food um, configured as they are configured as documents of uh, family origin and culture, where the tastes of places of origin are uh, recipied and family cooking practices from different origins are made public. I always use origins with um, quotation marks. This is not to, um, to disrespect those who anchor their identity to a certain um, point of reference, but rather to point out the complexity of anchoring your identity and that it is actually a, the, the relationship between an individual and where one deems that origin lies and how it is an individual choice, becomes an individual co choice in this context. Um, so also we can consider this as a more genderized literacy. As the examples we have seen earlier, the um, ads were calling for reading letters or memoirs of the grandfathers, and it seems as though it is the recipes and recipe notebooks of female relatives that are being read. Um, I, I purposefully left any theoretical discussion out of my talk because I'm talking about so many different things at once. But if you have any, um, any questions, I would be very happy to answer them afterwards. Um, because this is just very fast. I want to show it because I won't have time to get into it. Um, this is uh, the Cretan family that has published a private um, family history book. And um, the owners were very kind. They gave it to me. Um, they are originally from Crete, and they are also coming from, uh, from, they are anchoring their background to a Venetian convert to Islam. Um, and they also have this very fast again. Not only they have recipes, um, but they're also talking about the herbs in Crete, which are, you know, part of the culinary practice, the herbs in Crete. They are giving the, uh, the Greek and then the Turkish translation. And for those members of the family for whom these herbs are not accessible, they also have pictures and with uh, identification of each picture. So it's like a rendering the island in different ways um, also um, accessible to the members of the family. Um, so to conclude, the recent change in Turkey's public domain with literary and cultural products, family histories, documentaries, etc., opening a public space for hitherto unspoken events through personal narratives that I have briefly explored here might also be considered as making alternative histories public and thus bringing a plurality to a more straightforward to the more straightforward nationalist official historiography that contains homogenizing tendencies of the past and present peoples in Turkey uh, such as representations of Greeks as enemies or of all Muslims as Turks as embodied in school textbooks and problematized by various scholars in Turkey um, in the recent years, years as a question of human rights. Um, one way this is manifested in the context of the exchanged people relocated both in Greece and Turkey is the collection of family recipes attributed to the lost maps of origin, which once collected and archived function as identity markers, as we have, um, I have briefly tried to show here. And uh, thus they contribute to bringing a new legibility to identity traced to maps of origin. In this la uh, light, because the relationship between individuals and history has been a key factor in Turkish national identification process, I suggest that it is precisely this relationship between the individuals and the past that is going through a change in the public domain, which I consider to be the case of a new form of literacy in Turkey. In fact, I would argue that this is a new print culture. Um, and manifested not only in the personal quests for a legible past through recollecting family history, engaged at a personal level, such as letters, photographs, and objects, or memories, stories, etc., but also a new, as a new kind of literacy manifested in how these personal histories that are now being made public offer multiple readings of the past obscured events, such as the population exchange, left largely absent in the official versions of national history up until recently, as well as the diverse backgrounds of peoples in Turkey beyond that of the Turkish national identity. And therefore, um, if we are talking about uh, partitions, most of the time we're looking at the minorities. But I think what partition offers and, and an exchange of population, what it offers here as a, us is an opportunity to see um, a void is being created, yes, but then you're trying to uh, fill that void with another group that is arriving. And then how can we talk about the majority 
and what is the process um, to start dealing with that kind of a past? Thank you. Um, I'm very thankful to um, Evelyn and uh, Kathleen Morrison um, and of, of course all the uh, university for making this joint talk um, possible, thus enabling Asli, uh, Asli and uh, myself, uh, two specialists um, whose areas of research are often linguistically and institutionally partitioned from each other <laughs> in our own current academic settings. To begin with, um, the crossing over those partitions to engage with uh, some mutually resonant uh, issues that we have been exploring in our own respective fields. In the next uh, 20 minutes or so, um, because I'm a host and she's a guest, she has a more time, um, that um, I will take up some of the threads, uh, the Aslus, uh, the presentation that I think I bear directly and indirectly uh, upon those that I find interesting and important within my own areas of teaching and research, that is in the study of Korean and East Asian studies generally. Uh, Aslu's talk focus on certain hitherto unspoken uh, family uh, legacies uh, that are related to the 1920s uh, Greek Turkish uh, exchanges of the population, especially from the of the religious um, orientations. I listened uh, with a great interest, uh, especially uh, to her la a larger point about certain kind of uneven activation of the memories and identity layers that will emerge uh, later when the conditions are given. And also, I was very interested in the suppression of uh, the memories, certain memories, as she called it, sometimes oppressed memories or suppressed memories. And also, uh, or more the, for the further issue, the plurality of individual identities. Also, I was very much uh, appreciative of the uh, resultant difficulties um, in which uh, one can trace one's own identities in the combined context of many structural events uh, such as population movements, relocation, resettlement, and exiles, etc. Um, but it was also very wonderful for me to actually see the pictures uh, along with the, the, uh, the paper and it really revived many of the questions that I have not actually thought about uh, when I read her paper. Um, and I have to confess some of the uh, ignorances uh, right now. So far, my exposure to the discussions and debates surrounding the division and partition have been largely limited to 20th century instances of territorial and ideological uh, division in uh, three cases in particular, Germany, uh, Vietnam, and Korea. Asil's work has been a very eye-opening experience for me, not just because I have been embarrassingly ignorant of the uh, whole array of studies of the partition and especially uh, Ottoman Empire and also the Greek uh, regions. Um, but also, uh, I was very much ignorant about the religious uh, you know, backgrounds and the, the conflicts. But I was, uh, very, it was very eye-opening more because her work led me to see so many issues uh, that are actually comparable to my areas despite all those differences and all the barriers. And that has been very, very surprising uh, to me. To be sure, the reasons, uh, processes, and unresolved and still uh, live issues of what we may call partition effects or division effects might be vastly different from uh, each other or one, other, one another in many cases. Nonetheless, I came to see that beyond the differences of language and um, experiences of the affected populations, their lived experiences, um, and also the desire to articulate their uh, experiences, and especially around the eventful uh, division and partition and aftermath, uh, were often very similar to the, each other. More surprisingly, that the analytic language and conceptual tools that, uh, that Aslu uses are not very different from uh, mine, uh, with their roots in the Korean intellectual uh, methodologies. Basically, I find that the ways in which individuals were subject to, um, absorbed, uh, survived, um, and came to terms with the structural violence of division and partition do not overwhelmingly uh, differ from each other. 
Um, and yet, uh, there are certain questions that um, I want to raise because I find a very different kind of trajectories that Asli and I take uh, on the issues. And of course, I have to acknowledge that there are structural differences and historical differences. Um, and yet, I think I'm going into more of the uh, more oppressive memories, uh, whereas I think Asli seems to go into alternative memories. Uh, and here, I was very much reminded of the one question that Virginia Woolf asked uh, before uh, when she was talking about how come that middle class women began to write fictions in the 19th century uh, in Victorian literature. All of a sudden, these women began to write. And I think that she was asking about the timing of this uh, of, uh, proliferation of the novelist discourses, and especially a new group that began to uh, write. Uh, of course, it was not their own stories, but and yet, I think Virginia could trace the living room structure and where the middle class women could have leisure and actually have a, a public life, sort of, uh, opening her, themselves to the society. Um, and I think that just coming back from that question, I, I, I have this kind of overriding question like, how come now, why now, that uh, these older groups began to look into all the uh, suppressed histories. And I think actually you yourself asked the question to the person who had uh, opened the home museum, why not? And um, another uh, line of a similar question would be, why now to us? I mean, there, we could be involved in various different projects, but why you and I have to trace uh, these uh, questions now? Does it have to do with uh, the kind of uh, archival openings that are coming from Korea or in Turkey or Greece? Or does it have to do with American economical uh, development uh, or the European discourses that have been uh, uh, the, uh, allowing us to do? Or is it about leisure time or the mass, emergence of the mass? Who could get into the means of production, computer, chips, and also many copies, uh, copying machines. And I think that this, this really raises a very complex question uh, about why now? But I'm asking this question not because um, I uh, want to solve this, all these uh, questions uh, and issues. And also, uh, more or less, I, I want to see some different kind of uh, trajectories that uh, your case and my case seem to kind of uh, depart from. Um, basically, uh, in my case, um, this, uh, the divi we, we don't say partition, we seem to, uh, English language for the, the Korean case of division seems to be division uh, rather than partition. But I think, again, this really has to uh, invite uh, some of the inquiries. Um, and uh, this has to do with the ongoing nature of uh, suppression and ongoing nature of uh, evolving uh, openness uh, to uh, the uh, past memories. Um, I think that uh, my main talk would be about the women writers' uh, engagement uh, with uh, the, some of the family histories that uh, they have been uh, kind of uh, harboring, uh, not really expressing, and then all of a sudden uh, from late 1980s and early uh, uh, 90s, they began to write new stories. So this kind of, uh, uh, again, uh, asked me to I think why then. But I have my own kind of historical explanations, and I want to hear from you uh, about how you actually historicize yes. this kind of opening uh, of these discourses. So I want to hear that. But uh, before I hear from her, I want to just give you some uh, example of uh, some uh, conditions on which I conduct my own research. Um, before going to the, uh, the women's uh, the, this literature, I brought uh, three uh, magazines um, that has exactly the same um, kind of layout. And you can see that especially these first two issues, these are exactly the same. Um, and we say in Korean, 통일 문학, 통일 문학. Literature is a uh, munak, 통일 unification. So it's called Unification Literature. And uh, this one is about inaugural issue and 2008 uh, January. And it is exactly the same. And of course, here's a Korean uh, peninsula here. Um, what I want to uh, ask you to actually, uh, not just to see, but touch uh, 
around it, this clips uh, after I uh, circulated is that you will see the differences. And so um, the differences is that <laughs> um, one version is South Korean version and one version is North Korean version. And in fact, North and South Korean uh, literary writers, uh, not just them, but the writers uh, who are scattered around the world uh, who represent Koreans abroad, got together and produced uh, this uh, magazine. And this is the second issue um, of uh, the, uh, the same journal, published in uh, the, the July 2008, so this is number two. And I didn't get a uh, North Korean version. Um, so I cannot do what I want to do, what I could do with this first two issues. Uh, the first, first issue, the thing is that, um, if you look at the inside, everything seems to be just the same. On the surface. But if you see very closely, you will see that there's a tape here. When there's no tape here. So this seems to be the base version. The tape is added on this passage. And another instance um, is that um, okay, there's nothing here, uh, although I marked here. Uh, but if you look at the same page, uh, page 29, uh, then there's a tape again, white a tape, and. Um, again here, hey, and also again uh, here, hey, but this version is not. And uh, second issue case, I told you that I didn't get the North Korean version. This is the South Korean version, therefore. So this part tape again. And uh, some more tape here. Uh, some more tapes here. Um, quite a lot. Here. So I will circulate this, and you can just compare uh, those. What do these uh, uh, deleted parts or the uh, the top over parts uh, actually mean. Um, the example that uh, in question, that we, this is a Korean language, uh, the, the magazine uh, called Tongyeol Munha, and it was published by June 15th National Literature Writers uh, Association, which was officially established in October 2006 in honor of the 2000 June 15th Joint uh, Declaration of Peace uh, in Pyongyang when the previous uh, Nobel Prize winner president Kim Dae-jung visited uh, North Korea uh, and had a meeting with Kim Jong-il who is the leader, uh, dear leader of uh, North Korea. So June 15th is a very memorable date and around uh, that commemorative day, the writers got together and decided to create uh, this, uh, the publication. But the word unification literature uh, existed in North Korea before South Koreans actually adopted. Um, and in fact, the magazine itself began to be published in 1989 uh, 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 with the same title. But then one of the parts that the North Koreans did not change, and yet the, the, uh, the South Korean uh, version changed is about the origin of this uh, journal. So the journal says that this journal is published in accordance with the uh, agenda that is published uh, um, through this joint uh, talk between writers in 1906. And, um, they actually uh, began to uh, involve the writings, not only the contemporary North and South and the writings abroad, but also uh, writings that goes back to the 1970s, uh, recovering and reclaiming their common kind of heritage uh, together. 
Um, when I first saw the South Korean version, I thought, that, wow, again, South Koreans censor um, more. Uh, and, but when I actually traced the, the parts where the censorship took place, it's about how to call Kim Il-sung, the great leader who passed away. So it's uh, Aboji Suryang, and uh, so Suryang is the, the great uh, the leader of the nation, and that North Koreans call him, and South Koreans just excised those names. Um, and uh, one could uh, hope that uh, there would be no deletion, uh, but I take it as a very positive sign, in, fa in fact, inspired by Oslo's uh, talk, because it's about coexistence. It's about coexistence of different perspectives and different kind of uh, voices and different histories that developed, not in relation, direct in relation, but also coexisted with each other. And I think that um, the issue is not how to make a unified journal version, but actually have a tool, continue to talk to produce uh, this type of uh, magazine together. And I think the, the most uh, undesirable part is not about how much is censored, but uh, probably the prospect that one party will just walk out from the editorial meeting and decide not to meet. I think that's the kind of most fearsome uh, part that, uh, that I'm afraid. Um, one thing that uh, I want to just start from here uh, in relation to uh, the Oslo's uh, talk uh, is that in this kind of environment, uh, the Korean uh, literature's history itself <laughs> has, uh, has been uh, subject to division. So national literary history are divided. And some writers are mentioned in one history, others are not mentioned in that history, and also the evaluation will be different. I mean, most of the things have been divided in the past uh, more than 60 years. And in that kind of a situation, uh, I began to actually notice some of the differences uh, in which uh, the women's bodies, women's me uh, the memories, uh, uh, hold certain kind of aspects that have not been really spoken out uh, in the major legitimate uh, official spheres. And um, one uh, film clip that I, I wanted to show is from the film that uh, was shown in 19. 61, and this one was uh, shown in San Francisco Film Festival. Um, it's called uh, An Estray Bullet. Um, and the protagonist is going to his home located in, um, symbolically, Liberation Village, Hebangchun. But why is it called Hebangchun, Liberation Village? The mother is uh, in the sick bed. And she has been shouting that, let's get out of here. Let's go. So in Korean, it says, 가자. You cannot really hear. Oh, anyway, uh, you will hear the very uh, the eerie sound. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And the mother is always in sick bed. She's rather hallucinated. Uh, I'll just... Uh, I think I have to just uh, shorten. Um, the mother is saying, let's go, and meaning that there's something is missing here. Again, deleted. Um, in fact, uh, this uh, film version uh, was produced in 1961 by one of the most famous uh, directors in South Korean film history, Yoo Hyun Mo, and he based his own film script on the short story version that was written by a writer, Lee Bom-sun, in 1960. And in the particular uh, short uh, story version, you can see that let's go, but actually North is mentioned. Uh, let's, it, because of the name of the village, Liberation Village, you know that these people are from North Korea, living in South Korea, completely displaced, and just had some plot where they can have this kind of makeshift housing, and mother is put into the kind of a sli a slightly upper kind of region, and the people are just trying to survive. And the Liberation Village uh, was the kind of a locus that is uh, for, uh, the symbolic for the division. Because many of the people in North Korea, um, 
came down to South Korea uh, after 1945. And especially this uh, family must have been coming, have come either after 1945 or 1946 when Kim Il-sung, the North Korean regime, had a very drastic structural land reform following the socialist principles. And many of the uh, landlords and middle class people had to come down to South, sometimes leaving behind wives or daughters and taking only sons and just the South. But in this family, the father is missing, the old father, but the eldest son is going to take over the family. And the mother is always reminding the son, your home is north, let's go. But the, the whole split between two generations is about how much you can actually claim your past. And mother is completely kind of uh, ignored uh, from now on, although the, one, the sons and daughters are trying to fill her, it just doesn't work. But film version, any kind of ideological reference is completely erased. Uh, so um, this the difference between uh, short story version and film version can be traced to how much uh, the genre would be uh, exposed to the public. Short story version would be, of course, limited. Therefore, uh, the regime would just uh, let uh, any kind of ideological remarks just uh, printed, and the movie is another. Movie will be seen by hundreds and thousands of people. Therefore, there is much more suppression. But uh, symbolically, the mother here, mother's words, she, that's the only words that she says in the film. Let's go. But the ref real reference about home in the north is completely excised. excised. Uh, I don't want to, as, as Asla said, uh, I don't want to essentialize a lot of things here, uh, just a, a partitioning to the kind of bloodline or the biological kind of things. But there's a certain kind of differences uh, the Korean literary historians and critics began to see among male writings and female writings. And sometimes uh, the male writers' writings uh, uh, usually have a very agonized kind of aspect, especially ones uh, those, uh, written by those people who came from north. But many of the South Korean writers went north uh, in order to choose their own ideological uh, kind of uh, conviction that socialism is the better form. Uh, for Koreans at that time, right after liberation. So here, liberation uh, it has a kind of double meaning. It was a liberation from Japanese colonial rule in 1945, and Korea's division started precisely with liberation from Japan. So in the North, uh, the Soviet Union, and the South, uh, United States, the military occupation started from 1945. That was the moment of the liberation. So liberation, the word itself, is very, very loaded. Um, and therefore, uh, but so many writers just went north, and many of them were purged. Uh, so their histories also began to be erased in North Korea. But in South Korea, those people who went north are completely excised. So one of the, uh, the momentum uh, in which, uh, with which the stories that have not been heard began to come out is, in fact, after 1987, when South Koreans had a massive uh, popular uprising. They had uh, enormous uh, struggles uh, on the streets and also on the printed medias to get the direct election right from the military regimes that uh, were kind of running since 1961, when the, the movie uh, was uh, the filmed, um, and they won. So military dictation was gone, although the president that was elected after that was a former uh, military general who was responsible for the massacre in Gwangju in 1980. Still, people had a formal uh, direct election right. Then what happened was that under the pressures of the international society and also the Olympic Games, South Korean government decided to lift the ban on the writings that are related to those people who went north or who stayed north after division in 1945 and uh, also 1948 and uh, armistice in 1953. So when I mention these three uh, uh, chronological markers, each marker actually shows there is a massive migration each time. And so Korea's division is not just one line. Actually, there is a kind of overimposed uh, several layers uh, in this line. 
So after that, interesting things began to happen. Some of the young writers who have less, little memory of the Korean War began to actually go back to their family's past or their neighbor's family's past and began to articulate those people who have been completely erased, especially in movies. North Korean figures have to be always <laughs> smaller than South Korean soldiers. That kind of manipulation has been always going on. Um, so they began to uh, take out some of the figures that did not emerge in any, uh, any of the Korean literary uh, fictions, um, especially in the major ones, although there were some minor ones. Uh, that is, those people who actually held steadfast to their own credo, socialist credo. Uh, those people who are imprisoned 45 years, 50 years in prison, not converting themselves to liberal democracy uh, under the pressures of KCIA, uh, or uh, the writers began to actually trace some of the, their fathers who are living in China, socialist China, after uh, the, the liberation from Japan, who did not want to live in Sung Man Rhee's government, that is the first president of South Korea. Uh, because many uh, uh, kind of critical thinkers or the intellectuals uh, after the war, after the, the, uh, the Korea's liberation from Japan, really thought that Korea would have a better uh, future under socialism. So uh, many people went north and therefore the recovery of those names from the band list was a very important uh, the, um, the event. So sometimes these women writers uh, kind of make these uh, sons and daughters meet. Those uh, fathers uh, who chose to stay in red uh, areas. Um, and, uh, but one of the writers that uh, I wanted to actually talk more uh, in length uh, than others is a particular writer named Park Wan So. She's not young writers who began to write uh, just uh, in a new way uh, in the late 1980s. Um, she actually started writing her stories in 1970. And um, three things that I want to make a kind of point about her works in relation to especially Asul's talk. First one is that Paganza's work actually shows how the women's particular kind of social and biological life um, has been very effective to address the violence that is given through the partition or divisions. Because women are usually bodily figures and they have a very clear sense of kind of un unconscious about the past and also relation to the other beings, children. And also, their uh, social uh, identities were uh, kind of defined through their own status. Somebody's mother, somebody's daughter, somebody's wife. Um, and these kind of relational selves uh, gave these women writers to explore more of the very much unspoken kind of experiences and traumas and desires through the female figures. And Park Anso does a great job uh, on this. Another thing is that, um, one of the things that have been actually uh, uh, very interesting about Park uh, writing career is that she has been writing about her life uh, very much in detail from the moment of her debut in 1970 because her uh, brother was a, a once socialist and anybody at that time with a real throbbing heart was a socialist in Korea. So he had a kind of a time for socialism, but then he was disillusioned about socialism. He changed. And because of the change that he had about his uh, ideological kind of beliefs, when the Korean War took place, he had to be under great, great uh, stress because North Korean army just came down uh, all the way from uh, through the 38th parallel that was drawn in 1930, uh, 1945, all the way to the so-called uh, the uh, perimeter that is very small, tiny kind of spot in this, uh, the Korean peninsula. So within some months, uh, Korea was red Korea. And in that situation, uh, this very uh, admirable uh, brother uh, actually lost his sense in a way out of his fear to be revealed by the North Koreans uh, about his past uh, change. Um, so therefore, he actually volunteered to join North Korean army when the North Koreans came down. So, but then he also turned back from that uh, career 
to be himself. So you can see this schizophrenic kind of uh, life uh, choices. And that kind of uh, tra the, uh, experiences of change was a great trauma for the family because they had to always be fear about persecution, either parties, anytime. Um, interestingly, when Paganza wrote, uh, the same story about death of the brother changed. So when she wrote in 1970, uh, there was no ideological mention about the, uh, the protagonist, the relationship with the dead brother. Uh, the, the brothers are just dead on the bombing. When she wrote her story in 1981, actually a North Korean officer appears in the story and the brother is shot to death by the North Korean uh, officer. But when she wrote a long fiction after 1987, 1989, and after 1991, her own mother uh, died, she wrote a long story and in there, the real truth came out and uh, sh uh, her brother was not killed by uh, or any kind of uh, the, the, the North Korean soldier, but he had a kind of accident uh, with a bullet and he was dead. Um, but the reason why I trace this tra trajectory is that memory is not just still there to be excavated. In fact, what's happening in the society uh, to provide rooms for revealing or concealing the kind of suppressed truths. And Pagan's story actually shows that uh, women had to be always more fearful, fearful uh, about these consequences. And as the democratic situations got better, more stories are coming out. So in the rest of the time, I will just show you who she was, and then I will end the talk. But, Tina, okay. So the, um, So the first map is about Korea, and this is the demilitarized zone that is now cut. But there is a, if you think of a kind of palimpsest, there's a 38th parallel that was drawn at the end of the uh, World War II, and now it is replaced by uh, the, uh, demil the military demilitarized zone. So, um, that the, the, the military demarcation line that you saw in the red color was established in the armistice uh, agreement in July 1953. And uh, along this kind of lines, you could see the people who are coming from north to south and also people from south to north. And many f people uh, just uh, try to uh, make a conjecture on how many people have been actually separated from each other and some say that those people who are coming from north to south are from 700,000 uh, to series of um, one uh, official uh, document is five millions. And so they came down, but um, there were not many people who from, uh, came from south to north. So at this point, there's a population inequality, but also this has, has many explanations, but um, I think from the liberation point already, the population was quite uh, different. And partly the reason why the many people came from north to south is not just about their own middle class, but there was a carpet bombing during the Korean War, and there's a nuclear threat by the United States and allies. So many people had thought that if they follow where the Americans go, then they could live. So that's why many people came down to South. So this is the writer who uh, was in uh, 1944. At that time, her language was Japanese, written language, because she was a colonized subject. And this is the... Uh, uh, village that her family uh, came to from northern part of uh, the, uh, the, the Korea, um, but this is a Seoul, and they, although they were from the upper class, uh, they had to live in a very shoddy kind of uh, you know, marginal uh, place in Seoul. And the writer in her old age uh, is revisiting uh, the old place that she first, uh, her family settled. Um, in 1937 uh, and eight era. And this area was completely demolished uh, in the, the, uh, the 
1990s, uh, as Seoul as a city uh, began to get developed. But one of the things that she has been telling is that periphery always remains periphery because her old place seemed to be always uh, intact, underdeveloped. But finally, uh, even the peripheries uh, began to change on the redevelopment plan. Now I'm going back to Korean War era. And I want you to just to see how, uh, what types of uh, life that these women uh, had. On the left, you see the Pagwans are the, uh, the writer, uh, sorry, the left. And the right uh, side is her uh, sister-in-law, uh, whose husband was killed. Um, and one of the reasons why she began to write about her story is that she really wanted to test give a testimony to her experiences, but not first not about herself directly, but through someone else whose life seemed to be so much uh, kind of put to unjust uh, treatment because of the Korean War and colonialism and all that. And there's a, a painter named Park Sugun, one of the greatest uh, painters in Korea. And he always uh, paint many of his works are about women and naked tree. So her first novel was called Naked Tree. And uh, the writer was uh, educated uh, the, because of her mother's a very uh, enthusiastic educational zeal. And she was supposed to be new woman and modern woman. Uh, but after the war, she, uh, was, uh, she had to quit her uh, schooling. And she, although she entered the Seoul National University Korean Literature Department, her, uh, the education just stopped uh, with that, the war, because she had to be a breadwinner because there's only brother who was dead. And she got married. And from now on, you will see uh, another mother, uh, who is mother-in-law, uh, always with her, 1953. Then she becomes mother. And next a few slides are about her uh, motherhood uh, pictures. Um, and here's his uh, uh, husband. Um, and around uh, the time that this film was uh, shot, this is how the women and men kind of lived. Women in Korean costumes and men in a Western uh, one. This is the time that uh, she was uh, she was awarded uh, the literary award with the first novel, The Naked Tree. And this picture is very, very interesting in the sense that there's a gap between uh, the old woman on the left side and the rest of the women on the right side. And Pagansa is in the middle, and this is a part of the ceremony uh, picture, the kind of congratulation picture. Why there's a gap? This is uh, uh, about this uh, women's peculiarity. I think in men's pictures, this would not happen. But on the right side, there are in-laws. And on the left side, she's a birth mother. And in Korea, because of the new Confucian traditions, there is a whole cultural binding that women had to be subject to. That is, once you get married, you no longer belong to your birth family. And therefore, many of the uh, women's writings actually uh, in the, the 20th century didn't have much writings about her own mother, their own mother. It could be mother-in-law. So many of the stories about, in fact, the conflicts between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, but not about your own mother, because you cannot be really close to them. But Pao Guanso was in a very interesting position because her brother passed away. And uh, in one story that um, she wrote, uh, she began to actually see that the, her self had been quite psychologically distanced uh, herself from her own mother, who uh, had a very kind of traumatic experience about her son's loss. And in effect, in effect division of the whole nation created a lot of combined and derivative effects. And one of them could be the splitting even within the families. And the, on the writer's part, I think she wanted to have her own psychological sanity by moving away from her own mother, who did not want to actually live uh, um, because of her son's death. But also, um, uh, the mother herself uh, didn't really want to uh, kind of uh, relate to her own daughter because of the kind of trauma that he had because her son was one time associated with the socialist uh, practice. They could not even have a tomb uh, properly. 
they had to kind of like uh, tentatively bury uh, the son. And in fact, uh, after uh, some time uh, after the son's death, the mother uh, had a particular burial. Uh, and the burial has to do with, uh, sorry. Um, So if you look at this map, uh, this is a 38th parallel here. And now DMZ line goes this way, this crooked line here. So her family, her hometown, uh, was located in the north of, the, sorry, the south of the 38th parallel, <coughs> but north of DMZ line. In other words, for a while, they could visit uh, the, uh, this, uh, the hometown, but after the division, uh, especially for a kind of uh, consolidated through the armistice, they couldn't go. So what did the mother do about her uh, son's uh, body? She cremated the body and take the ashes to this island closest to the DMZ line, very close to her hometown, and then kind of sprued on the water. And of course here, I'm, I'm bringing these two tropes. Mother who really does not know the boundary between herself and the uh, child, and also water where the boundaries are kind of smushed out and blurred. And so with that kind of image, um, the writer uh, really wanted to kind of show that uh, there's an anonymous people who have been silently or vocally resisted this division that was forcefully imposed upon them and they were trying to do their own actions. Uh, and her own action was to write about her own mother. So this, the story that I'm just briefly introducing is about, it's called Mother's Stake. And one of the things that uh, is very remarkable about this uh, story is that um, set in a kind of a three, uh, kind of a timeline, it's a trilogy, last uh, sequel of the mother's take is actually about eulogy, eulogy or the tribute to her own mother and it was written after her mother and the story ends with her mother's own name it is a very bizarre line saying that from early on I thought it very strange that my mother's name was uh, did not have this particular Chinese character called uh, transparent or clear suk that is used for female names rather the suk that uh, Chinese character uh, that mother's name had uh, had a meaning of sleep. So sleep suk, not clear suk. And it was a very interesting kind of ending. But the reason why this uh, ending is important is that, um, in fact, the whole trilogy, Mother's Take 3, is uh, narrated uh, by the uh, Ohun daughter about her mother's death and funeral but usually taking the motive of sleep and body. In fact, her mother's uh, name was Ki Suk. There's a Ki meaning body, Suk, sleep. So the writer actually wove her own mother's life with her mother's own name, motive, and kind of like played with that kind of motive all throughout the, the narrative. And by doing so, as uh, the Asla kind of uh, the, uh, emphasized all throughout her talk, this is a personalizing history and returning the history that could be so easily forgotten about these anony anonymous people, actually putting her mother's name and her stories in the public discourse with this great uh, literary work. Thank you. Yes, I actually. Um Thank you. I, I really very much appreciate this opportunity to be put into dialogue with one another. Uh, I, I, am, I, I am thinking of various ways in which I can um, respond to uh, the very important points you have made, in addition to the questions you have raised for me, for my own work, <laughs> with your work. Um, I, I wanted to first begin by answering your question about the, the why now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, there is a lot to do, yes, with uh, in Turkish context, there is a lot to do with um, with the uh, with the uh, Kurdish 
claims for um, also identity, which has raised, I think, a lot of questions for people, uh, and um, of especially in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and um, with a lot of violence, well, a lot of bloodshed, and you know, and um, and so I think that people um, that I had interviewed, especially book publishers, like a publishing company owners, uh, music production owners. Um, like corporate, uh, and uh, what they, the main point was how can we start opening a, a platform for discussing without going to jail, basically. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, I think that is, at the time Kurdish issue was still too sensitive, um, or so they were, um, they were saying in the, in the interview, and it was actually. And, um, and so uh, another thing is, um, yes, there's the Armenians, but then how can you begin addressing that? There, that's still a big taboo. And, uh, and so uh, you have Greece and Turkey. Well, it's not only the Turkish government, but both Greece and Turkey as two governments have been accountable for um, the population exchange. So it seems to me that that was a productive way of starting. This is historically uh, speaking and, and sociocultural dynamics or political dynamics in Turkey. Um, uh, in addition to that, I do think that there has been um, a boom in memory work, especially um, in the 1970s, not only um, to the second uh, layer, and I think this has traveled everywhere else with internet and, and um, television series, etc. Especially with um, Roots, right, with Alex Haley. And then you have Holocaust a series in the 1970s, and uh, all of a sudden watching these and, and uh, raising questions about, um, about different um, experiences. Uh, I call them ruptures, but uh, different experiences. Um, and and uh, that were kind of not finding a space for articulation. Uh, and I do think that has enabled a space for rendering memory as a lingua franca to talk about these events. So um, in a way, I think that uh, we can explain this by the memory boom, yes, on the one hand. And on the other hand, with the fall of the um, you know, Soviet bloc, international human rights became, so, uh, I think Sidney Smith wrote about this, um, saying that, that international human rights uh, became the lingua franca of international relations. Mm -hmm. So increasingly, there were all these um, questions that were being raised. And um, in, in different co contexts and in increasing maybe pressures on different countries to come to terms with their, you know, um, skeletons in the cupboard. And, um, and so I think that has another layer to it. And then, of course, information technology. Even though in Turkey right now YouTube is um, <laughs> banned, <laughs> um, still I think uh, that, um, you know, you can still find your way, um, I guess. But... Uh, but I think that you know it's less likely to um, to stop people be, to being exposed to multiple narratives mm -hmm. because of the uh, you know uh, the information technology and how actually this is right now circulating. So I think that at the intersection of so many different things, that has become uh, a, 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 it has become possible for Turkey to in Turkey to talk about these uh, things. And I'm not saying that they're all going straight forward and it's going great uh, in terms of uh, speakability, if that word exists. Um, but uh, but it's a step. So um, as for the um, comparative frameworks, uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, the, the case that you are bringing up, which is quite fascinating to me. Which, and thank you. I have never had any... Um, uh, uh, I'm also embarrassed to say that <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had uh, much knowledge about it. And um, so I hope that this is the beginning of a <laughs> beautiful French book, <laughs> um, uh, speaking. But I do think that um, one of the things that is very interesting to me is that um, there's no discussion about, of course, as it is in Turkey, about identity in terms of, it, please correct me if I'm wrong, about who is a Turk, who is not a Turk. But it seems to me it's more ideologically positioning yourself. Um, so the partition takes place, and the discussion or the division in the, the discussions around it seems to be revolving around different venues. Mm -hmm. And it, it was um, it was very interesting to look into how um, women have in, like experienced this, and how the kind of family histories they are bringing into the public domain. Um, 
and putting faces into the you know unknown stories, right? I, I thought that was very interesting, and I wanted to ask you what is happening to literature, because the thing is, in in the context of uh, of um, of uh, many uh, literary works that we can see in the market today, not only in Turkey or uh, elsewhere, but also in the United States, it seems to me that um, uh, there are a lot of in very important and very, I have to say, very invaluable um, co contributions about um, uh, writing the literature of maybe less advantaged groups. Um, so that like some, somehow a kind of a minor literature so you do see like a lot of um, people writing about their family histories, Iranian women, right? Um, reading Lolita in Tehran, all these like, uh, and there's something happening in 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 uh, the the field that I am thinking about that opened the place to epistemological concerns. But then, what is also happening to literature itself as a result of this? And this is of course a side concern, maybe. But it's something that I have been thinking about very much. Because then what kind of um, books do we publish? What kind of uh, stuff do we start watching? Um, films. Um, and um, so that was one thing that came to my mind. And I wanted to ask you what is happening in, in, in Korean context. And also another uh, question I had was, um, you have shown beautifully the, the erased parts uh, and that selective erasure of two, uh, you know, the same, but they have banned or maybe didn't want to expose their reading publics to the same things. Mm -hmm. the, they, so they were selecting different things to erase or bad, like put the tape on. Um, and so my question is, um, you know, yes, there are many things that are being erased. Yes, there are many things that might, it seems, mm -hmm. uh, that are um, put in, in the side. But uh, can we then say that the mainstream is not to discuss these things? openly or can we say under those circumstances or it, can we say that these publications the novel that you mentioned is an alternative way of bringing history or did that become also a kind of mainstream in itself mm. in spite of maybe the censorship or, um, mm -hmm. or um, I considering yes. maybe since we don't have much time uh, if we can open up and if yeah. we, there are questions that are addressed to me in relation to what you raised then I can do together, so, I think. Yeah, I have some comments uh, with respect to uh, the first speaker's uh, presentation. Um, and so when you mentioned the deportation, uh, that the Greek government deported, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, it wasn't a deportation, it was actually a great exchange, as you said, population, right? And, uh, and uh, I think the number of people between the two countries were uh, totally different. I think there were 1.1 million Greeks that had to move to Greece from Turkey, and only about 340,000 Muslims or Turks. Said it. So there was a big, a big, there are many aspects in other words of the of, of this exchange of populations that you have not touched upon, maybe on purpose. Okay. But uh, uh, the fact also that. Uh, the stories of the other side. You haven't mentioned the stories or anything about the Greek side. You have just touched on. But her talk know. is about what her talk is about. I'm sorry. Her talk is about no, what saying, her talk I, is about. Yeah, yeah I'm not. I'm not <laughs> no, no, I have five hundred so pages. Many other I can send to you. That I need. I need to. That, that yeah. uh, could be analyzed and, and also they are analyzed. Uh, devoted uh, significant time to ours and. Uh, and, and we just heard just, just one side of it. Mm -hmm. And your question? Oh, I didn't have a question. I, May I ask? I just want to go. Okay. But I, maybe I can have a question. Is the fact that I guess this openness in Turkey, this late uh, yes. uh, openness where people are coming out with memories and things and so forth, is limited to, you know, to certain stories. And also, I think it's attributed possibly, what do you think, to the uh, aspirations of Turkey to join the European Union so there's more freedom of speech and so forth. And so Not on. all of them. The thing is, um, uh, I think that I understand that you would wish to hear something about Greece. Uh, my work is more clustered on Turkey, though I did spend six years of research in both. And my grandmothers are from Greece themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and one of the things that I have to say is that um, 
in, in Greece and Turkey during the population exchange, yes, um, you can say that the numbers are different, um, but I would invite you to go before that, to go to 1912-1913, uh, right before the Balkan Wars, when Bulgaria, Greece and Ottomans, Ottoman Turkey, um, they wanted to exchange their minorities, but then the Balkan War emer uh, erupted, and a lot of people who were already living there had already left. Right. They were already not, they were, but you raised this question, so allow me, please. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that, because these people had left, of course the numbers were not the same. And I'm not even claiming that all these people are Turks or whatever, because as I mentioned, there are many big population movements, conversion. We don't know the background of these people. But they were Muslims and they have left right, after the Balkan War. Yes, there were a smaller constituency that le were left in Greece. Um, and actually, it is not accurate that uh, during the population exchange, 1.1 million Greeks have left because many of them had to flee for their lives before the population exchange already. I'm not aware so, of uh, Most of them actually left before the... Yeah, the and so one of, the, one of the things is that is happening is, of course, there is this um, big discrepancy. Wow. But what happened also is that a lot of those Muslims who were living in Greece, when with the coming Greek Orthodox people, they had to live in the same household before they left for Turkey. Uh, I don't know if you knew that, but they had to share their own household and they knew to whom they were going to leave their belongings. They shared a household for about six months or so in different places. And, um, and so um, it's more common than you think. Um, and because they didn't have any place to uh, locate these people because of the numbers, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is the exact political legal term is deportation. Because both countries, when they are not asking, they are asking people beyond their own consent to leave, they are deporting them. And so, and there is no, and, and they have both done it. And so it is the exact term. Yes, it was agreed upon, but it doesn't change the fact that the legal language was deportation. So, um, but I do thank you for your question. It allows me to elaborate more on my points. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take my prerogative as the organizer to ask a question. Actually, yeah. it was very striking, one of the things that came up, um, is that in the case of the population exchange, the basis was um, something that was essentialized. Um, religion, well, to some extent was essentialized, even though there were obviously converts, especially to Islam, who um, went to Turkey. Um, and in the case of the division of Korea, it uh, clearly wasn't. Um, there's an aspect that's political and ideological, um, yeah. and then there's an, an aspect that probably affected much larger proportions of the population in both cases, which is just uh, chance and circumstance and, and where one was. Um, and this makes me think of a, a third case entirely, although one that you brought up, which is Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and in the current context where um, Europe and Turkey, even though it's not a member now um, of the European Union, um, but where there, there's a relative exchange of um, ideas and possibilities for um, Kay to go back to Crete and even though he's in the wrong village to you know, visit and, and people to move back and forth and um, to a lesser extent in Korea. But I'm, I'm wondering, much less. Much less. <laughs> um, I'm wondering about the phenomenon in um, how each of you would sort of think about um, the prospect of the, the phenomenon in Germany um, during reunification of the creation of what they call the well on the head of the people, mm -hmm. um, and sort of how that relates to um, to things that you see in um, contemporary sort of literary expressions. I think it's maybe more reason, more relevant to the Korea case. Um, do the kinds of um, national unification attempts in literary and other uh, kinds of um, fora um, do they reflect some kind of reality or um, do people, even if they sit at the same table, would their minds be blown if there were actually an opportunity for some sort of meaningful reunification? Um, and, and then what kinds of, um, on the Greek and Turkish case, 
what kinds of um, experiences, like what did Kay then think of the experience in Crete, or what kind of rapprochement is, is possible with former communities mm -hmm. and so forth, and are people's, are people's uh, sort of hopes and illusions about their past kind of exploded when they actually go to these places or you know, think about spending mm -hmm. time there more than a day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please. Um, I think German case uh, has been a great uh, kind of textbook material for many uh, Koreans, uh, both in political arena and also in the intellectual arena, uh, how to go about the Korean case. And um, I think the lesson that has been in a mold over quite often times from the German case is that uh, southern uh, the the Western Germany had to pay a lot of the cost for the unification. Does South Korea afford to do so? And this is a kind of like uh, the worry that has been going on in especially kind of like capital uh, list block. Um, can we do that? Uh, but there are people who have been thinking about, uh, it's not just about the cost that one has to think about. Uh, in fact, the unification issue itself is not about just combine this kind of unifying two separate uh, kind of states and people, and just bringing back some of the the separated families together. In fact, there are quite good number of people have been reflecting on how this Korean uh, national division case is not a kind of isolated instance. Uh, where the one cut is done, but it's a part of the very large world economy, uh, kind of world capitalist system uh, problem. So um, especially uh, one uh, thinker uh, the, uh, came up with this idea of the theory of uh, division um, following Emmanuel M. Uh, Wallerstein's idea mm -hmm. and how the Korean case uh, will not be just uh, worked out th through two-party system. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not the matter of just even part the political issue. It's an economic issue, and it's not just Korean issue, but Japanese issue, Soviet Union, China, United States, and these are all very much integrated into the one moment of a historical problem in the, in the world. So the issue is not just about how to just like, uh, you know, do the, uh, how to come to terms with the past. It's about how to live the present mm -hmm. on what kind of uh, conditions and terms. Mm -hmm. So I think that the public uh, the discussion is not just going about how to live with the, the, the North Koreans who have different experiences. I think it's about how to live us now, here and now, in South Korea, along with the new kind of system uh, in uh, uh, North. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think these issues are uh, very much in the uh, conscious and unconscious of the South Koreans. But if we think about just reunification as a movement, and the kind of things that you asked about whether these are, uh, in fact, uh, very much uh, in the popular mind, even to the extent that the literature can actually uh, carry out these ones, this is a slightly different issue. And I think also one ha I have to mention that there's an enormous range of generational differences mm -hmm. in South Korea. It's partly uh, it's an impact of the compressed uh, modernization. Therefore, people each uh, generation have very different uh, relationship to uh, the country's well-being. <laughs> and also, uh, they have a very different differential relationship to the past. Therefore, uh, very different groups are discussing very different issues mm -hmm. together. And it's, it's a kind of like unification issue is, uh, is a challenge itself. Uh, and yet it's also how the, each uh, group of the society actually handles in order to be themselves in the society is a very much more of an issue. Uh, but going back to the literature issue, um, there are not many people who are thinking, reading that kind of journal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very minor group. Uh, and it, it's in, in fact, those people who could publish that journal and have that journal uh, are very uh, privileged people, intellectually and politically in a sense, because they are not really widely commercialized at all. And also ideologically, uh, that kind of attempt is uh, sustained by very, uh, very politically conscious small group of people. 
although uh, economic trades are done uh, much more in an active way. For instance, the kaesong that the, this particular writer came from is the uh, economic free trade zone where South Korean capital and North Korean labor can meet. And although this is now mal mal malfunctional at this point. Um, so a lot of exchanges are going on. Um, and yet, certain kind of level of the, the collaborations are done in a very small contained groups. And yet, I think that the reunification is important not because of that particular content, but it's a kind of effect. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's about uh, South Koreans' democracy. It's about the quality of life of our South Koreans. And so once the unification issue and the division issues are mentioned, then there's a whole other issues have to come in. Mm -hmm. And these type of uh, kind of opening up of the uh, political uh, issues began to be much more activated uh, after 19, late 1980s. And one of the interesting things about uh, this phenomenon is that yes, on the one hand, the literature began to pick up that kind of uh, opening, and yet uh, socialist block was collapsed, therefore there's a lot of kind of political anomie uh, kind of phenomenon is going on. So the writings were not quite adept to the uh, very fast change in political mm -hmm. uh, seasons, rather postmodern kind mm -hmm. of uh, phenomenon came in, and new generations were kind of inundated with a lot of postmodern works. And yet, I think television, films, visual dramas began to actually pick up some of these uh, issues mm -hmm. and popularize uh, those uh, issues that had never been really public. And I think this is one of the kind of happy cases where popular mass industry and political issues could go hand in hand, not necessarily all the time, but there are very happy cases where very good politically sane project could also gain certain commercial popularity. Mm -hmm. And that's done through major television networks, mega miniseries, and that would be going, usually coming from literary scripts. Mm -hmm. There's a base novel, base uh, stories, and then that will be turned into the script for the visual mm -hmm. materials. So it has been going on in a very comprehensive kind of level. It, it seems like a big negotiation mm -hmm. taking place in the public domain. Yes. It's it's um, thank you. <laughs> um, one of the one of the things that uh, I um, I try to do in my work is to look at it as a question of repertoire, uh, mm -hmm. repertoire mm -hmm. as a dialogic space. Mm -hmm. Um, that is um, that is uh, something that uh, is being shaped uh, every time some some a person is being exposed to something, and whether you reject it or you take it, it's your own personal um, uh, you know choice, of course. Um, but uh, but so what I think that is happening in the case of Greece and Turkey, there was a big rapprochement between Greece and Turkey after the earthquakes, and Greece sent uh, help to Turkey. And so, um, and it was actually quite embarrassing because the Turkish Minister of Health declined the blood donations coming from Greece. Don't ask. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, then anyway, uh, there was another earthquake that happened afterwards in Greece and then Turkey sent some aid there. And so it started off like that. And the two ministers of uh, foreign affairs were actually friends from Christen, which helped. So. Um, uh, not maybe necessarily as a negotiation, uh, so, so a unification, in, but it, more, I think, as a question of opening the repertoire to, oh, the evil other one, right? I think, uh, and in the case of Greece, uh, what, what it really differs from the case of Turkey is Turkey, every dissident identity was, you know, not encouraged to be public, right? Um, erased, if you will, in the, in the official history. Uh, in the case of Greece, um, those, uh, people who came from uh, Turkey to Greece, they were archived as early as 1950s. Penelope Papayas, who is uh, teaching in Bolos, she's an anthropologist. She's working on this. Um, she has worked on this. Uh, and, um, and so it's like as early as 1950s, they are archived. But, uh, and, and you see that there's a, there are a lot of you know, books, uh, like you know, um, written novels, etc., about the experience of the Hellenic experience in Turkey. But um, what was missing from that picture was those who left. That is also now beginning in Greece. In the 19, 
late 1990s, but especially 2000s. Greece, uh, in Greece, you see now more books being published about the, the coexisting communities uh, and being beyond the pattern. So it's another, I think, a contribution to the repertoire because people started going back and forth. And, uh, and it was one of the things that I encountered which was amazing to me. Every time I would ask in Greece um, any person who had arrived from Turkey, um, they would all want to, you know, it was, I was very lucky, or very, very kindly welcoming me and asking me questions and they were all willing to share their stories. But one of the things that was interesting is how were the Turks, they were terrible. But uh, how were your neighbors, they were great. Uh, it was the same thing in Turkey. Uh, when I was speaking to the people who had arrived from Greece, how were the Greeks terrible? How were your neighbors? Oh, they were amazing people. So it's it's again a question of repertoire. How do you, how do you phrase it? And it's, I had to be very careful about how I should be phrasing my questions because you can get the answer you want just by phrasing the question. So my anthropologists know all about that <laughs> better than me. But um, but so I think that uh, in that case maybe maybe not a unification, but a, includes a more inclusive repertoire shaped uh, between the interactions of individuals and the public domain, uh, I, I would say, is happening now. It's exciting. That's great. Thank you. Um, we're really out of time. We're actually about 10 minutes over time. So I encourage people to get some food. And um, if you can, ask the speakers any other questions that you have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> Thank you.